see you guys. Glad that uh, we're out here to gather to worship the Lord. And just a, just a reminder, continue to keep the, um, the people on the big island in prayer because, man, they're really getting hard hit. There's not too much relief in sight for them. And we just uh, hope and pray that um, they might be calling out, crying out uh, for the Lord. Hey, just a couple quick announcements. Our turn to serve at the mission is coming up next month on Tuesday, July 24th. So that's always a wonderful time of blessing as we uh, get out and serve the community as the guests come in. Uh, the guests, uh, the mission is a magnet for those to come in and hear the word of God and worship God and uh, enjoy a hot meal. So uh, just a tremendous opportunity. We meet down at the mission at six. Uh, and you can see us for more uh, information after the service. Coming up this Sunday, guys, uh, our church barbecue potluck. Sign-ups are available. Always a lot of good food, good cow cow. So come and join us. Uh, enjoy the fellowship around the table. And uh, that's always a blessing. Uh, we're going to begin our new study in the book of Amos tonight, guys. The book of Amos. And I was kind of, kind of a great book. I was kind of just wrestling how to begin the book? Do we look at the life of Amos? Do we look at the signs and times of what was going on in the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel? There's so much going on, and we, we can almost go back to when uh, Jeroboam the first broke away, uh, uh, and he took the ten tribes of northern Israel with him, and the nation of Israel was divided into two parts. The northern kingdom of uh, Israel, also known as Ephraim or Samaria, uh, and the southern kingdom of Judah. But quite an interesting study. We'll get into that later on in the study as we kind of look at hey, what caused this division, what caused the split, and what caused the heart of the people in the northern kingdom of Israel to drift so far away from the Lord. Not that the people of Judah were so perfect too, because they were doing the same things in their idolatry and their worship of other gods. Uh, seeking uh, uh, seeking other things and feeding at the trough of the world, guys. But this book of Amos, guys, like Jonah, categorizes a minor prophet, but not minor at all, guys, because he had a powerful spiritual message of, prof of prophecy, not only for the, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, but the southern kingdom of Judah, along with the many nations that surrounded the little country, uh, country of uh, Israel. He seeks to call the wayward northern kingdom of Israel to repentance and to return from the Lord. Guys, this guy Jeroboam, he was a bad king, man. You know, he set up his own altars uh, in, in Bethel and in Dan, and he uh, made some golden calves, and he, he instituted his own days of worship and so on and so forth. So he said, hey, if I, set, I let these people go down to Jerusalem to follow after the festivals and the feasts that we are required to attend, he says their hearts are going to be with the, their, their brothers from the southern kingdom of Judah. So he interest, interest, uh, inter, uh, instituted his own worship holidays. He had ordained his own priests, not of the family of Levi. And the people's hearts were really drastically turned away from the worship of God. But it was a bad time. Uh, uh, Amos, again, his mission was uh, one of repentance, uh, a cry of repentance and to return to the Lord. Amos lived in a time, guys, of relative peace and safety. Uh, the borders of the northern kingdom of Israel were pretty secure, guys. In fact, with the defeat of its northern neighbor, Syria, Israel actually extended its borders. It was a time of growth in the northern king king kingdom of Israel. Additional trade routes uh, uh, were taken on because of this expansion into the, the, the area of Syria. Israel prospered even more financially. Isn't that amazing? Hey, these guys, their hearts were far away from the Lord. Yet for some reason, they just seemed to uh, uh, prosper. And uh, Byron and I were talking about that. You know, it says, uh, the psalmist talks about the wicked that prosper. And he says, their eyes bulge with fatness. And they, they live in this prosperity. And I know, you know, God, that uh, these rich guys, they live such blessed lives. But yet now the rich grew even richer. And their hearts were hardened towards the poor in the land. See, here's the, there was a great disparity between either, either you're really rich or you're really poor. And their hearts were hardened toward the poor in the land. Um, and even worse was the spiritual state of the people who went through the motions. 
But their religion was just that, guys, like going through the motions, no heartfelt relationship. So you can be religious, you can be good on the outside, you can really say, I gave, I volunteered, I went to help pick, paint the school, I went to pick up rubbish, whatever it might be, but there was no heartfelt relationship. There's no talking story with the Lord. There's no having all things in common. Or that point of meal with the Lord, the, the fellowship that you have. Oh Lord, I'm going through this. Oh Lord, I'm crying out to you. Oh Lord, forgive me because, you know, I've I, I done a bad, you know. Oh Lord, you know, help me through this because I just need your grace to help carry me through. But uh, sad to say, many may have thought that their peace and prosperity was a byproduct of God's blessing. They kind of thought that, hey, look, we're doing so well. God must be happy with us. You know, we, uh, we're we getting blessed. And even though times of drought and plagues did come, guys, and even worse, you know, there were, there were times of murder and mayhem, but they failed to call out to the Lord. They just said, hey, we gotta get tough, the tough, the going gets tough, the tough get tougher, you know, and whatever it is. But in the relative, uh, conditions of prosperity, their hearts were given over to the desire for more. Guys, you know, it, it, it sounds like a bio for our life in the United States today, or life in this world. Uh, relative conditions of prosperity uh, uh, brought their hearts, or their hearts were given over to the desire for more. Yeah, I want more. I want better. I want bigger. You know, if cheese is good, I want more cheese on my spaghetti. <laughs> Whatever it may be. Uh, but uh, immorality ran rampant, and again, justice was perverted. Immorality ran rampant, justice was perverted. You know, kind of, they, the, the days that they lived in were not too far off from where we are today. Kind of sounds like us today, as a matter of fact. You know, kind of thinking about it. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Amos. The words of Amos was among the sheep herders from Tekoa where he envisioned envisions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Here at the onset, guys, uh, uh, Amos identifies himself. He doesn't claim to be any special agent of God. He doesn't say, he doesn't have the press release, he doesn't have the, the publicist, he doesn't have that uh, publicity drive saying that he's coming into town. Or he didn't attach any name or title to himself. He says, I'm the very uh, most high reverend prophet of God. Nothing like that. He simply says, I am from among the sheep herders of Tekoa. There was a, a, a job that was a quite a humble, humbling job. You know that David spent many days out of that sheepfold under the stars. And, you know, much of the time you may have missed a lot of the celebrations, a lot of the uh, a festival washings and the ceremonial cleansings and, and so on and so forth. A lot of times the shepherds were considered unclean. And yet, yet he says, I'm just among the sheep herders of Tekoa. Tekoa was a town in the mountainous region of Judea, about six miles outside of Bethlehem, guys. Kind of, kind of a small podunk town or something like that. Yet he states the fact, the visions he saw in this time, which uh, was uh, 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 in the time of uh, Judah, Jeroboam was the king of Israel, uh, uh, Uzziah was the king of Judah. Here again, he also mentions an earthquake. Uh, and it's so interesting that when you mention a thing like this, an event like this, you know, recorded history must have recorded this earthquake. Uh, like our volcanic uh, eruption, they just showed uh, from the space station a satellite, uh, 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 a astronaut filming you can actually see the, the lava glowing uh, on the big island from way up in space. And you know, for all time, this event is gonna be remembered. Uh, June 2018, uh, you know, the volcano was going off uh, in, on the big island of Hawaii. But yeah, he, he mentions this earthquake. And Zechariah, some 15 years later, in his book, Zechariah refers to, as he describes the second coming of uh, the Messiah in chapter 14, Zechariah, he, he mentions this earthquake that, that Amos mentions, and it's kind of fascinating because you would, you would never think that, hey, how the word of God dovetails of one with another. Verse 2, he says, the, uh, and he says, the Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice, and the shepherds pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. 
he was wasting no time. He, he, he pulls no punches. He doesn't hold back, guys. The land, uh, the Lord roars from Zion. He says, and like a mighty lion roaring, the sound of the, the lion of the tribe of Judah must have been awe-inspiring, guys. Uh, uh, gaining undivided attention or probably bringing fear to all who heard. Uh, to all who heard. And you, you can kind of think that, hey, man, if you're out there in the field, and you hear this lion roaring, hey, you're going to be holding on because you know that something bad is coming. And what he's saying is, hey, this lion is giving you a guys a signal. The lion is roaring from Zion. He's roaring from heaven, man. And, uh, and like the trees of the field clapping their hands, he speaks about the, the, the shepherd's pasture ground mourns. And it's like the, past, the pasture lands mourn. What a, what a sad picture, yeah, guys. Like the mountain tops of Carmel withering with lack of rain, with lack of moisture. Here are the lives of many afflicted by their waywardness. The waywardness of sin, guys, brings that moaning. The waywardness of, of sin brings that drying out of the fruitful land. Carmel must have been a really beautiful place, you know, Carmel by the sea, atop the mountain with a lot of rain, a very beautiful place. But he's saying, it, uh, like like the top mountain top of Carmel, drying out, so your lands are, are just kind of withering away. He goes on, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and four, I will not revoke its punishment because they thresh Gilead with implements of sharp iron. So I will send fire upon the house of Haziel and it will consume the citadels of ben Hadad. I will also break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avon to him who holds the scepter from Beth Eden to the people of Aram will go exile to curse, says the Lord. Gaza was, uh, uh, Syria was one of Israel's uh, tormentors for many years, guys. Its capital, uh, Damascus, he says, you, you've gone past the point of no return. You've gone past the point of no return. Enough is enough. Uh, the, the threshing of Gilead is reference to the treatment of the people who are threshed like stalks of wheat. You know, the enemy came in and they just radically just mowed the people down. Like, like a giant lawnmower, they just kind of tread the wheat out. And what he's saying is here, they, tr they thresh Gilead with implements of sharp iron. They just mold the people down, guys. And Syria, again, are cruelly treating the people of Israel. In, in 2 Kings 13, uh, 10 and 13, God has allowed Syria to be used to punish Israel at one point in time. But they had gone over the line in their cruelty, breaking the bar, cutting off the inhabitants, of him who holds the scepter speaks of the impending captivity of, uh, by the Syrians of this people, uh, uh, by captivity by the uh, Assyrians. Six, six to eight, for thus says the Lord, for the three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they departed an entire uh, population to deliver it up to Edom. So I will send fire upon the wall of Gaza it will consume our citadels, and I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod. He who was the scepter from Ashkelon. I will even unleash my power upon Ekron, and the remnants of the Philistines will perish, says the Lord. You know, the five cities that he names here are the five main cities of the Philistine people, guys. And Gaza, again, was one of these five main cities of the Phil Philistines. And here Amos rails against them for, you know what, human traffic human trafficking. We hear about it every week in the paper about human trafficking, about how people are being trafficked here and there. And uh, Somebody was just mentioning about uh, in parts of China or Taiwan, uh, how the women are just trafficked uh, like, uh, like, like pieces of merchandise, guys. It happens uh, uh, everywhere else. But here, uh, Amos rails against them for actually for human trafficking, guys. I won't uh, I won't revoke their punishment because they took whole villages and cities and towns, all the people within the Jewish boundaries, and sold them as slaves, guys. 
Can you imagine that a people would come in into your city, they would take every man, woman, and child, take them captive, and sell them, uh, uh, sell them into slavery. Worse yet, they sold them to Edom, a descendant of Esau. So it was like brother or family and saving family. You know, uh, you, you kind of think that, hey, this is a downer, man, Russell. Look at all these guys. They're going to get all wiped out. God is saying that, hey, he's going to send a fire from heaven, and judgment is coming upon these nations, upon these uh, uh, peoples around the city of Israel. But God is working from the outside in because really he's, his, his aim is to come and speak to the hearts of the people of Israel, guys. They sold these people into Edom, a descendant of Esau. So really, again, it was like brother or family and saving family. The law protected the rights of slaves, and those captured in battle were permitted to be enslaved. Yet the law protected them. Here it was a clear case of simple trading in human cargo, as if they were cattle or sheep. And you know, you know what this really took me back as I was reading through some of the commentaries and studying up and just really letting the thing kind of speak to my heart. I was, I was kind of thinking, hey, this is where we were at as a nation at one time. You know, we brought in just thousands and thousands of slaves that were just taken captive by these slave traders from their homes, from their homelands, and they were brought over here, and they were sold into slavery. And you know, uh, um, uh, I'm not saying that we feel the effects, but we do feel the effects of what happened uh, back in those days. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the Lord has a lot to say about trading in human cargo. Uh, here they treated the people simply as, as cattle or as sheep or as goats. In the New Testament, it's clear that all men are created as equal guys and saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. You know, slavery in the New Testament time, it says like in uh, many parts of the land, it may have been as much as 60% were slaves and the rest, 40% were free men. And, and when you kind of think about that, uh, uh, the slaves and the slave owners, the slaves and the free men worship together in the New Testament church. They worship together, they ate together, they minister together, and uh, they received salvation in that like manner. There was no difference. God was the great um, bringer of equality. God was that one that we've always said there's no black, white, brown, pink, green with yellow polka dots. You know, God creates all men uh, in his image and God loves all men equally. It's when man gets involved in this and uh, selling people as slaves, taking them from their homeland and selling them like merchandise. Uh, this is what was going on in the days of Amos in the name of profiteering, in the name of making money. But now uh, Israel was the, uh, uh, was the recipient of this poor treatment, guys. It was happening to them. Thus says the Lord, verse 10, uh, For three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they had delivered up an, an entire population to Edom. And they did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So I will send fire upon the wall of Tyre and consume her citadels. Here again, uh, uh, Phoenicia was a, a, uh, a was a people group along the northern coast of Israel, guys. And at, at one time, you can kind of think that, hey, Tyre and Sidon, weren't they helping uh, Solomon when he was building the temple? Weren't they supplying him wood and so on and so forth? At one time, guys, during various times of biblical history, Tyre and Sidon have been mentioned in a favorable light. In other words, they were not exactly uh, of the same makeup or the mindset of the, of the Israel uh, Israelis, but uh, there was a mutual respect, a relationship that could work together in relative harmony. In other words, there were trade uh, agreements. There were uh, they were working together to buy and to sell, and you know they were bar uh, partners in uh, in economic uh, things and so on and so forth. But there was a relationship to work together in relative harmony. Yet uh, here the Philistines. Uh, uh, they ended up uh, selling captive Jews as slaves off to Edom. They forgot their brotherly relationship for the sake of profit. I gotta tell you this, guys, much of the time today, for the sake of profit, uh, people cast everything, all the decency, all the things they know that's right and wrong, 
they cast it to the wind. You know, you know uh, the tragic thing when you have a tragedy, whether it might be uh, the tornadoes and hurricanes on the mainland, it might be a tidal wave, uh, it might be like this uh, volcanic activity and the flooding. A lot of times people come in and they, they, they make out of this misery out of people. They try and make merchandise or they try to make money or they try to attach themselves, try to find an angle to where I can get a piece of the action, all this money that's coming in. Uh, they say the same thing about our rail transit. We've run uh, millions of dollars over budget and a lot of it uh, was given over, people say. A lot of it went over to consulting firms that just did a, collect, collected a lot of money, but really didn't do a, lot of, a whole lot of work. It was like political payoffs or whatever it might be. A lot of times in the name of decency, in the name of helping others, people take advantage. Uh, uh, and this is what happened. The Philistines that started off as, as, uh, as friends, these people of Tyre and Sidon, Yet uh, they delivered up an entire population to Edom again, just wiping out the people of a village or a city and again selling, selling them into slavery. They forgot the brother relationship, the brotherly re relationship. And right here it says in verse 9, they did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. At one time there was a relationship. At one time there were things of decency. At one time they saying that they were doing things that are right. Uh, unfortunately, there always comes a time that men did whatever was right in their own eyes. And at times, guys, you know, I, I hate to be jaded, but I think that sometimes, you know, we are there, like we are right here as a people. That a lot of people are just doing whatever is right in their own eyes. Uh, they forgot their brotherly relationship. It all went out for the sake of profit. Judgment came as Alexander the Great used tire, a uh, white tire out, and left it. Uh, for a place of drying nets. You can see Ezekiel 26 and 27 speaks about the wiping out of the, the, the city of Tyre. Uh, utter, utter destruction, guys. Sometimes you kind of think that, hey, Lord, how, you, how long are you going to let this injustice go? How long can you see the poor people suffer? How long can you see the injustices of the world? Hey, God is not slow about his promises, some count as some but desires that all men will come to that place of repentance. He's looking to extend His grace. He's looking to extend His mercy. He's looking like uh, to the people of Nineveh, uh, that 120,000 strong. He didn't want to wipe them all out, but He wanted the Word of God and that, that call, that cry, a repent, turn, turn back to me, rather than being wiped out. And you know, again, God is not, uh, uh, please to wipe people out or to send people to hell or anything like that, but he does everything he can to extend that hand of grace and mercy to people. Verses 11 and 12 says that thus says the Lord, three transgressions of Edom uh, and four. What, what, what that, that term means, three transgressions and four, he says that hey, you've just gone past the line of uh, being reasonable. You've, you've taken it to the the, the, the point of no return, the judgment is going to come, he's telling these people. I will not uh, revoke his punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword. He st uh, stifled his companion, his anger tore continually. Oh, isn't that interesting? He stifled his companion. It's like he choked his companion out. He maintained this fury forever. And it speaks like of this burning anger, a hatred that was in upon this guy's heart. I will send fire upon Timon and uh, consume the citadels of Borza. Remember, guys, that the Edomites were descendants of Esau. And between Jacob and Esau, uh, there, was, uh, there was a straining that began from before birth. Remember, it's, it was kind of like they were in the womb. They were kind of wrestling with each other, fighting with each other, these two brothers. And I gotta tell you guys this, that everything, so much of the stuff goes back to the book of Genesis. All the relationships, all these immoral relationships, all these relationships that went bad, it all started back in Genesis. And a lot of it comes right back to modern day times now, about these guys who were, uh, uh, they were angry men, they, you know, uh, their fist was against everyone the Bible speaks of. And you can see it today that hey, their fist is still against everyone. And, and uh, this is where it all starts. 
a straining that began from before birth. God in all his sovereign wisdom had chosen the younger brother to receive the blessing of the birthright and all the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. Yet uh, uh, how these things work out always left a tension between the brothers. You know, uh, you know, you know that Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of lentils and how Jacob listened to his mother and fooled his dad and uh, uh, fed his dad the, the tasty uh, food and now how his father blessed him. It was kind of by trickery. And you can kind of think that, hey, these guys are trickery. Jacob was a tricky guy. And you can kind of say that, hey, we, have, we all have that little bit of trickiness in us, too. <laughs> Look at our president. They used to call him Tricky Dicky, you know, Richard Nixon. <laughs> but that's the, that's the humanity of man, guys. It's kind of like Jonah. We can laugh because we did so bad, but we can say, oh, we just like them. We just like Jonah running, disobedient, and we cry out. And then, you know, when the, the cords of death entangled us, and, and yet we still get mad. Oh, just, it just off me, Lord. You know, I, I'm going to just die rather than listening to you and going to preach to these guys. But yet, you know, uh, the tension between these two brothers is still exists today, guys. Amos speaks of the anger and hatred that was uh, harbored against Jacob, who is Israel, guys, and his brother Esau, who uh, became Edom, as called out right here in this passage. Edom is Esau, guys. So Edom was again picking on his brother. Edom was the one that stifled his companion. His anger tore continually. You know, if we looked at that original word in the original language, that would be an interesting study because his anger uh, uh, tore continually. What does that mean, man? His anger just burned. It wasn't like an anger that just kind of went up, you got angry, then you calm right down. But it was an anger that just burned, and it was just seething, and it was just like getting hotter and hotter. And the hatred was growing for his brother. And this is exactly what God was talking about. This is exactly, you know, it happens within families. It happens within communities, you know. It happens. Guys will go crazy. And uh, uh, he maintained his fury. But he says, I'm going to send fire. And then fire is always a cleansing agent, guys. Fire has a way of purifying. Fire has a way of cleaning away all the wood, hay, and stubble, right? Now what's left? It's the good stuff. The gold, the silver, and the precious gems. And a lot of times when we go through the fire, sometimes the fire comes our way, guys. And the fire hurts, the fire burns, and ooh. Don't play with fire. <laughs> One time when Paul was small, we took him to this uh, company party, and uh, he was playing with the candle. And then my, uh, my friend said, oh, his wife was telling him, look, daddy, the boy playing with fire. <laughs> And everyone was watching him because he's playing with the candle, yeah. So, you know, he, uh, his wife went to the mainland the other night, so I call him up, I tell him, hey, don't burn the house down. <laughs> I said, where did that come from? <laughs> I, I told him that, I said, don't burn the house down. <laughs> guys that play with fire. And again, uh, two brothers, guys, 13 to 15, we're going to conclude, oh, we're going to conclude good tonight because... I think we have some piece of pies waiting for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the sons of Ammon and for four, I will not revoke his punishment. He says that, hey, it's coming, man. This judgment is coming for these lands around you. Because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead. Wow. In the Bible, it's kind of harsh. Yeah? This, is, this should be R-rated, man. Wow to enlarge their borders. So I will kindle a fire on the wall of Rabbah and will consume our citadels amid war cries on the day of battle and a storm in the day of tempest. The king will go into exile. He and his princes together, uh, princes uh, together, says the Lord. The Ammonites and the Moabites, guys, the Ammonites and the Moabites were descendants of Lot. Remember Lot, Lot was the nephew of Abram. And, and Lot was that one who, uh, he looked up, he says, hey, I like that well-watered area. Uh, it looks lush, and you know, it was Sodom and Gomorrah he settled in. And the Lord rescued Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Yet uh, his wife, not wanting to leave Sodom and Gomorrah, she turned back. She looked behind. And she got turned into a pillar of salt. And uh, Lot was left with his two daughters. And the Moabites and the Ammonites were descendants of Lot's uh, incestuous relationship with his two daughters. He had sex with his two daughters, guys. And these bad guys, these Ammonites and Moabites, uh, from the very beginning of this people, they were enemies of the Jews. They were enemies of the Israelites, guys. We see that uh, they invaded Gilead and brought a wholesale slaughter to the people. They didn't even sell the people into slavery. Forget that. They just murdered all the people. How heinous is that? They were just stone cold killers. They murdered the people. Selling them off of slaves at least would have spared their lives, but this was a wholesale massacre for the sake of the land. What did they want? They wanted more land. They wanted more territory. They wanted more pasture land. They wanted the houses. They wanted the, the riches of the people of Gilead. So instead of, uh, uh, instead of enslaving them or selling them off as slaves, they just said, hey, we're just going to massacre them. Oh. And God is saying, hey, I will not revoke his punishment because they did this thing, these heinous things to, in order to just to enlarge their borders. So I'm going to kindle a fire on the wall of Rabbah and consume her citadels amidst the war cries of the day of battle. A judgment is coming. And guys, you know, it's so appropriate to me because the judgment of the Lord is coming again, you know. Uh, these were, these were um, the nations around the land of Israel, but really it speaks to my heart that one day there's going to be a terrible time. It's going to be the, uh, the this day of tribulation that's coming. One day when the Lord catches his bride away, he takes the church to be up with him. He says, come up hither. It's going to be our time. We're going to be caught off this planet. God is going to remove us. It's going to uh, begin a period of time that, you know, it's going to be the last seven years of, of life here on this earth. I mean, you know, for this world, guys. And, you know, as things come down, it speaks of, you know, uh, that, that second half of the tribulation period, a lot of terrible things are going to happen. Judgment will come upon the land. And I think that these are all just reminders of the precursor of what's coming down uh, in this time. It, 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 it presents us, it questions us, it spurs us on that we might live lives uh, that are uh, above, above par. You know, we, we might live lives that are uh, reflecting the love of Jesus. Christ. We might live lives not given over to the things of the world, not saying, hey, I not need that bigger house, I need the bigger bundle, I need this, I need that, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need the things of this immorality and the relationships, whatever it might be. But it says that we will live for the Lord and live lives that are exemplary in the eyes of the world. They say something like, hey, what about that guy? What about that lady? There's something about them. Oh yeah, they go to church. You know, well, I think they're Christians, you know, and, and, and they kind of get a think that hey, maybe there is something about this Jesus. Maybe there's something about Christianity. Maybe I ought to give Jesus a chance. Like uh, I hear that little voice speaking to me late at night, you know, and you know, it, it, it starts with us first. Revival starts with us first. Revival starts uh, right within that one little square that we're standing on out there. And, and, and we don't want to move out of that square until we know that hey, our lives have counted for something. Counted for something good. We've made a difference. We've done something for the betterment of this community, of this world, of our neighbors, of this world. We've prayed, you know, we've witnessed, uh, we've been good witnesses of out in that world. And even though people don't want to hear it, even though people say, hey, you kind of preach here, bro. Get out of my face, you know, and this and that. You know, we, we've done, you know, we look for that opportunity. We don't want to uh, be offensive, but we want to just say, hey, Lord, open the door. You open the door. Let me walk through it. Let me be bold. It's like the early church. Sunday mornings, we go into the book of Acts. Just like Amos, we're going to see these guys called the apostles, called the disciples. And, the, and we're going to see Annas again. Ooh, we're going to look at Annas again Sunday morning. The, the high chief priest, the most reverend high chief priest. We're going to see Ad, Annas again on Sunday morning. And he's going to be looking at these guys and say, hey, what's up with these guys? You know, they're just fishermen, man. They come from the waterfront. They're just the scuzz of the earth, you know. <laughs> just bring us to Ahi. We'll be happy. Let's stop your preaching. <laughs> 
But anyway, good study Sunday morning. We're going to look at the guys. We're going to see Annas again, our favorite character from the temple. And we're going to continue on Wednesday nights. Amos, we got to love this guy. We love these guys. And uh, uh, we, God has given us a good light to look, even with all the things upcoming. Uh, he, he gives us a lot of good things to clean. Let's pray. Father God,